The insurmountable quest of scientists has been to answer the unanswerable, question the unknowable, and delve into the black regions of darkness which surround the mysteries that make up the small world within man's limited perception. Is the world real, and the thought essentially a true reflection or merely an illusion brought about by a mind separate from the ultimate reality? Thus is the question of man. In the year of discovery, 1881, when science had found the first leaves in the great volumes that were to follow, Dr. John Malthus, my father's father, had not only sired a son, but had undertaken of himself the fleeting dream of medical men from his day and before down to my own. That of producing everlasting life. In a dark house, and laboratory that would one day be inherited by me. Dr. Malthus pondered through the long hours of night over beakers containing the fluid of life. Life that to him indicated one thought alone, that it should be continuous and never ending.
Take a lot of abuse to whittle that down very much. <laughs> My friend, you'll never know the amount of abuse undertaken to get it there in the first place. <laughs> He's right, Inspector. That's uh, some kaposis you've got there. It's a good thing it wasn't you instead of Dr. Malthus up on the gallows. I doubt if they'd have found a rope large enough to carry out the job. Your humor overwhelms me, Mr. Sims. I hope you can put it to use in your own behalf. The next time your wife requests one of my sergeants deliver you from the floor of one of your favorite taverns. But your sergeant and I see eye to eye, Inspector. Don't forget, uh, policemen can't have too many friends. I won't forget. Now that it's over, have you any regrets? I mean, in the way you handled the case. I never have any regrets when justice is served. Justice is part of my job, even if it gets distasteful ever so often. Well... It was short and sweet. The slate looks clean. However, I think the doctor was responsible for a lot more crimes than many of you officials gave him credit for. But you can only hang a man once. In his case, the penalty happened to be too light. Tell us, Mr. Detective, what you might have uncovered that the inspector here didn't. Well, take my sister-in-law, for instance. Those gifts she was receiving in the post of smelling water and the silk things. She swore she didn't know who was sending them, and I believe her. So? Well, just what would you make of it? Well, did you encourage her to keep these things? Certainly not. They're the type of articles you'd find in a brothel. 
How exactly would you identify your sister-in-law in relation to women? That is, women connected with a brothel. <laughs> I wouldn't identify her at all in that respect. But you automatically ad identify Dr. Malthus with the whole business. On what grounds? I know what you're thinking. It's just a bit of a temptress in every woman, and I suppose you're right. But... Well, it takes a certain caliber of man to bring it out. And there's only one uh, correction. There was only one of that kind around here. I take it you hold Malthus responsible for about every crime we've had lately. Well, what about those incidences that happened in Homely a couple of years ago involving three different women? Now, they never did come up with anything in the way of evidence, did they? Mr. Sims, Homely crimes were written off long ago as due to a physical cause and nothing more. He never should have been referred to as crimes at all. Ah, uh -huh, but the deaths were attributed to something other than natural causes, weren't they? I bet they didn't even bother to find if they had any blood left in them. Of course, it's a bit late for that now. It's a bit late to pin it on the doctor, too. Well, as I said, you can only hang him once. <laughs> Sounds like you'd like to have a hanging once a week. <laughs> you know, Inspector, I've somehow had the feeling that you sympathized with Malthus. I still feel that way. Don't confuse sympathy, Mr. Sims, with fear. That's right, I said fear. The insecurity of those who come in contact with something they cannot rationally understand. I imagine the scars go deep for those on the inside of it. Well, it's always difficult to keep a proper perspective when dealing with a basic criminal mind. However, there is little difference in the prosecution of one who seeks to destroy, whether it be physically or in a more subtle manner. Are you referring to a state of mind or the realm beyond our comprehension? In my opinion, the two are inseparable. Only that the degree of comprehending the so-called mysteries of life varies in each individual. Surely you don't believe a man can possess supernatural powers. Well, I'd say that one could have a superior understanding of what is. He therefore is capable of exercising many things. You know, something that never came out in the papers and got my curiosity aroused was the, the length of time. That is, how long was he actually involved with these experiments? Why, well, I know of three or four people who were going to his office right up to the time of his arrest. Mm, you don't know when he actually started. A lot of us would like to. It's a pity, I'd say, that a man like Dr. Malthus got into such deep water in the first place. He was a good doctor. He seemed dedicated, too. Many is the time that he came at midnight and even later when Ginny was ailing. Well, maybe she didn't have the type of blood he was looking for. Well, all the same... He's going to be difficult to replace, even though he did go balmy. Well, there's a good question to be raised about the extent of his condition. You think he wasn't insane? Well, he refused to be examined by all the court physicians. Perhaps that's an explanation in itself, hmm? Well, you don't imagine he wanted to be hanged. Now, no man would ask for that, crazy or not. He made no effort whatsoever to do anything about his guilt. Could be his conscience. <laughs> oh, that's one thing we established quite firmly. Dr. Malthus didn't feel himself guilty at all. He believed himself absolutely justified in everything he carried out. And you still question the fact whether he was balmy or not. <laughs> oh, Inspector, I'm surprised. Well, to be honest, I'm a little surprised myself. So it seems were well, many others... Well, those that involve themselves to the extent of seeing really inside the case, there was much to be observed once you got beneath the surface. How old do you think Dr. Malthus was? Oh, I don't know. 30? 33, maybe? <laughs> we uncover the fact that it was 27 years ago that he graduated from medical school. Well, that means he'd been practicing here for at least 12. Matter of fact, I was still a sergeant when he first lanced a carbuncle on my neck. <laughs> you know, my wife, Jenny, used to say, the doctor always looks so young. You, you're turning into an old man, but the doctor looks so young. <laughs> she wasn't the only one to notice. And you honestly believe that these, these experiments with bloodlines gave him some sort of a fountain of youth? Well, I don't know what's possible and what isn't. A policeman looks for facts. And let's the experts do the uh, analyzing. In the case of Dr. Malthus, I, uh, the facts, unfortunately, are still in that laboratory somewhere. 
The reports and his notes and such haven't been seen by any of us. His family absolutely refuses to let anybody in the house, and we have no legal right to search it. I'd say a lot of those doctors would like to take a look. <laughs> you can bet on it. They all agree on one thing. Malthus was a most unusual man. He had secrets that perhaps none of us could believe possible. Whether or not there was any good in them is a question for the scientists, and it will take the best of them. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, it's a question that even the best of them probably will never be able to answer. Thank you. Oh, I'll look at it. Hello, Beth. This is Janie at the office. Doctor's been completely tied up with appointments since morning, and it looks like a full house for the rest of the day. He asked me if I'd please call his fiancé for him and explain that due to his heavy schedule, which you truly understand, he can't make dinner at your house tonight. <laughs> yes, yes, how well I know. But you'd better get used to it if you want to marry a doctor. Actually, the papers just came through on the house he inherited. His aunt's attorney recorded the deed yesterday, and he plans to look over the rooms tonight, right after he makes a house call. Don't ask me. He wants to see it tonight. wave of something unnatural seemed to reach out from the very beginning. This, the house of Malthus, was his house, and his presence in it was unmistakable.
Impossible. Possible. Fool. Miser. Coward. You haven't the strength to take life. I'll teach you of it. Mine, you see, is immortal. I'm sorry, miss. I don't know when the doctor will be back. If he wasn't expecting you, perhaps it would be best to leave a message. He went after blood plasma or something like that, I think. Beth had become concerned over my behavior of secrecy, and I knew an explanation to her was something I had to face up to. She was greatly disturbed with my sudden attitude of aloofness, as she put it and wanted a precise answer to her flat accusation that I was no longer interested in her and our plans for marriage. In realizing that a woman's concept of any unusual circumstances is generally ruled by the emotional stream of reaction, and in Beth's case, would be considerably more than average, I knew it would be asking for unnecessary problems and possible disastrous complications if I would reveal any inkling of the situation I had become involved in. Beth's reasoning that I had gotten myself preoccupied to the degree that I had forgotten my social obligations to her family as well as to herself was valid enough, and I found it most difficult to explain away my actions in such a way as to be convincing and at the same time hide the real nature of what had been consuming the majority of my hours inside the laboratory that only I knew existed beyond the upstairs library. The fact that I had begun to act in this mysterious manner since moving into the house was interpreted by Beth as a bad omen, not only for the present, but in regard to our life together after marriage. She felt assured that in some way the house itself was to blame and could never become a place of happiness. I vainly pointed out that in the years that were to come, all talk of omens, good or bad, would long be forgotten. Dr. Morphis had found himself in an environment that to him would without doubt bring about the final complete success of his long-awaited experiments. His delight over modern-day apparatus had brought such optimism that he flatly stated that the time was fast approaching in which he would have the answer to his problem of blood separation and soon would provide a continuous supply of cells that inherently would never break down within the body, no matter what the circumstances. These would in turn provide each organ with the necessary nourishment to regrow themselves perpetually. As a scientist, I was, of course, greatly intrigued Beth had assumed a new attitude and somehow convinced herself that a doctor involved deeply in the many problems of research should be viewed with a great emphasis upon patience and understanding. Even to her mother, who was beginning to doubt the sincerity of my intentions, Beth persisted in the defense of that in which, even though she knew nothing of the details, she felt was a legitimate and necessary part of my medical probings. As fate would have it, the time arrived when the first real clue to my actions would be heard firsthand. The visitor was a colleague of mine, Dr. Clinton Bernard, who had for years worked side by side with me at the hospital in which we both devoted two days a week to the charity patients. Dr. Bernard felt uneasy about his visit and wanted to apologize in advance for bringing news that was not only unpleasant, but perhaps a breach of faith that is held so highly by those in our profession. In coming to Beth at this time, Dr. Bernard hoped that the two of them could in some way derive upon a plan that would influence me to the realization that my entire medical career was in jeopardy in the circumstances he had become aware of. He told Beth quite frankly that I had been observed on two occasions inside the hospital lab during the hours in which everything is normally dark and such entrance is strictly forbidden by anyone in the hospital employ. It was found that several vials of the rarest drug combinations were missing from the shelf, and also a great amount of plasma and pure blood had been taken from the refrigerated vaults in which very few individuals had access to. But Beth was conservative in her evaluation of what she heard, and was relieved that Dr. Bernard had come to her instead of the authorities. 
Her faith in me was admired by Dr. Bernard, but unfortunately not shared. As while he had not himself actually seen the act of theft taking place, there was little doubt in his mind as to who was responsible. Beth promised that she would take definite action at the earliest possibility in relieving all suspicions that, to her mind, were not at all justified. Don't turn on the light. What's wrong? I've begun to age. You aren't fast enough with the blood supply. I have it. Your plasma compounds are no use to me. Did you get it in the natural state? No. You idiot! Poor, weak fool! should let you die. Doctor. Wake up. Doctor. Doctor. Malthus! Malthus!
So what do you make of it, Ed? I don't know. Could be a simple case of elopement. Could be those people who reported it to the police overplayed everything. Then again, all this hullabaloo in the papers could be legit. Uh, but the trouble with the papers, they always play every story to the hilt. Always go the same route. Well, I double-checked every crank call that came in last night. Especially those out of the Hancock Park area. Nothing. Did get one, though, that kind of made me sit up and do a double-take. Oh? Well, that's the kind of a thing you'd throw me out of the office for. Well, come on, let's hear it. Look, Ed, I don't want to wake your old so this early in the morning. Ed, it probably has nothing to do with the disappearance of the Benson girl anyway, even if it did turn out to be more than a crank Sergeant, file. Sergeant, I've been around this office for a long time. When someone digs into the crank file, I know what to expect. Now, let's hear it. All right. I got a call from a woman. Now, she claimed that she saw some character drag a girl off down the street. The time was exactly right, and it was smack in the center of Hancock Park. And you call this a crank call? Right, because that's not the whole story. Oh? Well, Ed, she claimed that... She claimed the guy didn't look human somehow. She claimed he was some sort of a monster, Ed. A vampire. A vampire. Ed, I told you... All right, right Sergeant, thing. all right. I asked for it and I got it. Oh, the trouble with this job is you grab at straws and you come up with broken fingernails. So what'd you come up with at the house? Any leads on her parents? A boyfriend, maybe? Uh, we located the employer through a paycheck. I sent Richards over there to check on some of the girls who might have worked with her. <laughs> Lieutenant Jameson. Yeah, Richards. Uh-huh. Right. Okay, I got it. Yeah, you stay with her. Right. So? Well, there was no particular boyfriend, so that rules out the elopement angle. But uh, I want to talk to that woman. The one who claimed she saw that vampire. Bring her in. I want to talk to her. Why? Would he turn up? Well, one of our girlfriends from work went to church with her last night. And before they went home in opposite directions, she claimed she saw a figure behind some trees. But she thought it was a teenage prank because of a face mask. You know, one of those monster faces. What time was that? About 10.15. What time did you make it? Right around 10.30. Uh-huh. You know, Ed, it sounds as if... It sounds as if he'd almost gone there to wait for her. Who are the officers that made the call? Delaney and Fisk. Now, they ran a patrol around the entire circumference of Hancock Park between 10.40 and 11 o'clock. They double-checked with the patrolman on duty in the grounds. He'd just gone on his shift, but he told them that the man before him had reported everything was quiet. You know, there's no possible place to park around there. There's none permitted, none for miles around. Now, that would pretty well rule out the possibility that uh, she was dragged off in a car, wouldn't it? And maybe she's still in the neighborhood. What, in a house a few blocks from her own apartment? He'd have to be a nut to pull a stunt like that. Well, who else would wear a face mask? Well, any way you look at it. Kidnapping isn't what the well-balanced citizen will participate in for sport. Right. Lieutenant Jameson. Well, how long has she been waiting? All right. All right, send her in. I'll talk to her. Now, stick around. Let's see what this one has to say. Come in. Uh, won't you have a chair, Miss... Uh, Mrs. Vernon. Mrs. Vernon. This is Roger Vernon. Well, Mrs. Vernon, what, uh, what can I do for you? Well, I really didn't want to bother you, and I still don't know if my coming here might not be in haste, but after reading the morning paper about this poor Benson girl's disappearance, well, I thought it would be best under the circumstances. You uh, know something about the Benson girl? No, I'm afraid not. It's just that it touched off a wave of fear about my maid. Well, what is it you fear about your maid? Well, it seems she's also disappeared. You see, she's been missing for several days. And at first I told myself that whatever she did was her own business. And except for my being without help, well, I shouldn't interfere in her private doings, even if I did feel they were a little strange. Strange? Well, I felt it was somewhat unusual when several nights ago, 
She told me she was going to see a doctor she knew to donate blood for some kind of transfusion. Well, it sounded odd, but then she seemed to know him quite well and had been doing part-time work for him in exchange for medical bills or something. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't in any way believe the doctor has done something wrong or anything like that. It's just that I'm frankly concerned that she may not have gotten there. You see, she left late at night without even changing into her street clothes. And didn't she uh, pack anything, a suitcase? Well, I've told you, she was wearing the uniform she works in. She put on a coat and went out the door. I see. Well, we'll look into it for you, Mrs. Vernon. Uh, now, just give me the name of the doctor she went to see, huh, please? Well, I, I wish I knew. If I did, I would have called him myself. Hmm. All right, then, uh, will you kindly give us some information about her? Name, age, family? We'll start with the address. Now, I assume that she had a room with you. Yes, she did. Our address is 409 Elmwood Lane, north center of the Hancock Park District. Give it up, Malthus. Malthus, you can't get away with it. Malthus, listen to me. I know what you plan to do. I've read your notes. But what you have in mind will never work. Sure, you have three people now and you require a total of four, so you think. But the blood types won't mix the way you think they will. Malthus, you can't just lock people up as if they were animals. Where are you going to stop? You monster! You monster! Monster! Taking over my identity had provided everything necessary and every facility to ensure the successful propagation of his continued fortune. A ready-made life was his to step inside of. When a definite date had actually been made for the wedding, even Beth's mother was happier than she had been in years. Everything seemed in perfect order until Beth wondered why a scarf should be worn indoors. Let us touch our hands lightly upon the table and concentrate fully on the forces that will bring help to each individual present this evening. Let us pool our strength and our vibrations so that each one may concentrate his mind completely and without reservation into the one channel of harmony that will lead us into the realms of ether let us put our minds into the one channel and our bodily vibrations into one unified force. Let us concentrate with our being, with all our thought power, until it is directed toward the one point of combined strength and harmony that will allow us penetration into the realms beyond. I believe the current is forming in which our minds may travel upon. 
May we have the first question, please? I'd like to know if it's possible to locate three missing documents pertaining to the estate of my uncle. It seems he was the only one who knew where the documents were hidden. Can I have some information on this? We will try. Something is wrong with our channel. I don't get anything at all. Maybe I'm trying too hard. No, it's not you. But we're being blocked. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you come in. We'll have to start again in a few moments. I'm glad you came. I had a radio call to come, but I didn't expect anything quite like this. Frankly, I'm a bit surprised. Won't you sit down? Thank you. I telephoned your captain and explained what we're doing here. Have you had a talk with him about it? No, I tried to call him a few minutes ago, but he wasn't in. The desk clerk at the hotel told me where I'd find you, and he gave me a message from the captain. Do you mind? No, go right ahead. Tell me, do you have any new information on your maid? Not yet. Well, then why did you call? Well, aren't you curious about what you've seen here? Mrs. Vernon, when I'm told to go to a place, I go. I've seen a lot of peculiar things in my life, but I try not to let my personal opinions interfere with the job. What is your opinion of this group here tonight? Well, I really don't think that's important to you. I've only been doing this sort of thing a short time. I attended a few sessions as a sitter, and one of the best mediums in the country told me that I would be able to do exactly the same as herself if I'd work at it. Now, I certainly don't claim to know everything there is to know about it, but I've already met with a certain degree of success. Well, I'm very glad to hear that, Mrs. Vernon. I was able to get a vision of Frida. Now, it was only fragmentary, but I saw her locked up behind bars of steel. Now, Mrs. Vernon, I, I think we'd know if she was in jail somewhere, vision or no vision. Well, I didn't say I saw her in jail, but definitely inside some kind of cage or cell. Well, it was Frida I saw, I'm certain of it. Now, I don't know how you saw what you say you saw, or if, in fact, you saw anything at all. I think some kind of a scientist would be better qualified to discuss that with you anyway. What I am interested in is some information on your maid, some information based in fact, and some information that I can follow up on an intelligent basis. Are you familiar with the work being done in Europe by mediums connected with police departments? Yes, I've heard a little about it. Well, there was a case in Holland where the criminal was found within 10 hours after the search began. Yes, you're talking about the uh, Sebastian murder. Yeah. Yes, there was a good deal of noise about that. I'm also aware that the wire services tend to pick up a story like that and capitalize on it if they can. Unfortunately, they tend to play up those items that are hottest in news value and to play down the routine matters that are a little bit dull by comparison. I'm not completely familiar with the Dutch police or all of their procedures, but I'm sure that this medium was not the only factor that brought the killer in. Well, I think you'd find it interesting if you went a little deeper into what actually happened. You see, the police had only one clue to go on, a button that was torn off the shirt of the murderer. Yes, and then the medium went into some kind of a trance and described the murderer, right? A full and factual description. It was unusual because the man was something of a giant, six foot seven or so. Now, they have mug books over there, the same as we have over here. And how long do you think it would take any police department to filter out all of the suspects that are six foot seven? If you remember the case, that man turned out to have a criminal record as long as your arm. So you've just admitted it was really based upon the medium's work and nothing else. Well, how could they know to look for a man of those proportions without the information? I don't know, Mrs. Vernon. I've told you I'm only vaguely familiar with the case. I'm really not interested in it. What I am interested in is some information on your maid. Now, do you have some for me, or don't you? Well, I told you I haven't. Not yet. Then that's the way I'll write it in my report.
You're the only one who can reach the keys. Try it. Thank <laughs> you. 